yeah, the, the the transfer portal for the winter window definitely was good to them. I mean, first and foremost, they didn't lose a lot of guys. Um, and that's a conversation you and I have had in the past. And one of the things James Franklin does a tremendous job of is roster retention. And, you know, it is kind of corny or whatever it is. It may sound to some people that family atmosphere that he builds within the program, that environment. I think that's a big reason why, because there's kids who have had opportunities to leave to go to a school maybe closer to home or where they might get more money in NIL and they don't. I think that's a big part of it. So they didn't lose anybody of note. And um, their additions were they hit key positions. You know, you had Julian Fleming, I think is the probably the most well-known name of the group after his four years at Ohio State, spending the last who's a starter. It was, it was a five-star recruit from Southern Columbia High School, which is not far from Penn State in Pennsylvania back when he was in high school. So um, definitely a very familiar name for Penn State fans. I think he's going to add a lot to the wide receiver room, not just with on-field production, but that was a room that last year, by all accounts, really lacked a true leader, lacked the guy who was going to hold people accountable. And coming from the most competitive, most talented wide receiver room in the country, I think Fleming's going to bring a lot of that with him. I know there's a lot of people within the Ohio State program who fully believe Julian Fleming will be a coach one day. So I think that leadership aspect he'll add to the wide receiver room will be just as impactful as what he'll add on the field. You know, maybe most importantly is Keandre Lambert Smith, who, you know, a pretty familiar name after being wide receiver one last year for Penn state with Fleming in the fold, you can put uh, Keandre Lambert Smith into the slot, which is what Penn state wanted to do last year. But when things never really clicked with Dante Cephas, uh, KLS was forced to stay outside. Fleming can be your outside guy, put Lambert Smith in the slot where he's better built for. So that was a big addition A.J. Harris as well, cornerback. Um, some places had him as a five-star recruit coming out of high school. Everybody had him as a top 75, top 50 guy. Uh, rivals, we had him number 41 in the country. He played in eight games as a true freshman in Georgia this past year and is just transferring because he wanted to find a cornerback room, basically, that's not as loaded as Georgia's. And Penn State loses a lot at cornerback, so that was a big need that they nailed. I mean, I think there's probably an argument to be made that Harris might have been the most talented cornerback in the portal in the uh, – Another big name that they brought in, Nolan Rucci, another former five-star recruit from Pennsylvania. His dad is a former letter winner at Penn State, um, played a lot of years with New England, was on the Patriots all-decade team of the 90s as an offensive lineman. You know, Out of high school, I think everybody expected him to wind up at Penn State. He went to Wisconsin, a big part of that being that his brother Hayden was a tight end at Wisconsin. And as an offensive lineman, you can't really fault anyone for picking Wisconsin for developmental purposes either. Um, but he's back home now. He was a kid who I think a lot of people in Wisconsin expected him to step in as a starter at left tackle this year. But when uh, Nelson decided to come back to, to college for one more year, I think that probably played a role in Rucci transferring. Penn State has two open jobs to tackle, so we'll have a chance to compete for a starting job there. But, I mean, they've added some other depth pieces. Jalen Kimber, who will be a depth guy corner. Uh, Chase Meyer, a kicker who at Tulsa last year only missed one PAT and only two field goals. So, you know, they, they've done a good job of tackling their needs thus far and well, also retaining their roster pretty well. So definitely a successful first portal session here for Penn State. Okay, Marty, I'm going to put you on the spot about the family atmosphere. How, how is that manifested? Um, I mean, again, this sounds corny. It sounds cheesy. It sounds dumb. But James Franklin, whenever he talks to his team, anything everything he says every speech it always he always starts ends with everything starts with i love you everything ends with i love you and i think that just kind of encapsulates that you know i if you read coming out of visit weekends you know they they prioritize the whole family they're going to be a, a coaching staff who they're not just recruiting you they're going to recruit mom and dad grandma grandpa siblings whoever it is and i think the thing is they do a great job of getting to know the whole family making the whole family truly feel like they're part of the program not just the player that that goes a very long way towards building that family atmosphere in that within the program that they have and again like i said i think that's a huge reason why they're able to do what they do with roster retention especially in the era of the transfer portal and nil and that sort of thing and i got to think that for individuals who are used to strong families Maybe they take it for granted, don't understand it, but then the 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 parents and everyone around them understands that uh, you're going to miss this. So you you want to go somewhere where you're going to continue to feel this kind of support. And then for unfortunately those individuals that never had that, that uh, might 
in a sense, be a little uncomfortable or whatever, be different for them, but they may just run to it, embrace it and be like, yeah, I've, I've never had a family kind of atmosphere. So, uh, you know, I was commenting right before you came on that we can run to the pessimistic NIL corner of this is always the driving force of every move that any player makes. But let's also notice that when these coaches are leaving, they're bringing a lot of players with them. Those players mm -hmm. signed with that coach and then they're, they're leaving to go play for that coach because that's what they signed up for. And they attached themselves and they, they saw something in that coach that they wanted to be part of. So they left. Yeah. And you know, I think you're seeing a fine example of that right now with Alabama. A lot of the guys that are coming with Kalen DeBoer are guys who are only in their second or third year of Washington. So guys that DeBoer recruited, not necessarily guys DeBoer inherited. And, you know, to circle back to the family aspect, I think too, you know, and I'm sure as, as a parent, Mark, you, you can relate to this. If you're going and seeing these schools with your sons to, and they're trying to decide what, what school they're going to play football at. And as a parent, you see that atmosphere, you see that environment. And again, you know, like you said, as a parent, you're going to get that, like, Hey, this is important. You're going to want this. And that's going to help win over a lot of moms and dads and that sort of thing in recruiting. I mean, oftentimes in recruitment, Mom's the most important person, mom, grandma, dad, whoever it may be. Those are the people you need to win over more than the actual players. And I think that goes a long way because, I mean, you, you mentioned wanting to play for these certain coaches and how NIL isn't the be-all, end-all. I think Julian Fleming is a good example of that. You know, he obviously had a great relationship with Penn State's coaches in high school, being a local kid, being a five-star recruit. Even after he committed to Ohio State, he would continue to come to team camps on campus when he did. There would always be the pictures of Franklin talking with him and, Clearly, they kept that relationship strong, and Fleming even said it when he entered the portal. He entered the portal with the idea of going to Penn State and nowhere else. He wanted to come back home for his last year, in his words. He still had that great relationship with James Franklin and the staff, and I know there were other schools who offered him more money in NIL deals, but Penn State's where he wanted to be. So, I mean, I agree with you. I don't think – I think a lot of people see NIL as, like you said, this big scary monster of – well, it's just going to be like the pros where everybody's going to take whoever offers them the most money. And that's not the case. And that's where building the, those relationships, the environments, you know, the, the cultures that places like Penn State have become so important and can be so beneficial to you. I mean, look at look at Texas A&M is the complete opposite, right? The, they signed the greatest recruiting class ever. And it's just because they threw money around and it's been a complete disaster for them because they didn't have any of the other things that go into it. I hope that uh, things work out for Julian Fleming. Uh, he was arguably the best wide receiver coming out of high school and he gets to Ohio state and I would not in any way term him as a bust. He had a really nice season two years ago, caught six touchdowns, like 33 balls. But when you're in that number one, he comes into a situation where there's obviously he's tripping over five stars in the same wide receiver room. Then number two, he gets nicked up. He, you know, he just has nagging injuries that, kind of don't make him quite right. Well, maybe if he was somewhere else, they would have forced him out there. He would have forced himself and been the best option still at 80% or 70%, but there he's not. And then he gets behind the eight ball there. Uh, again, two years ago, he, he put it together to a certain extent and, and wasn't the first option or the second option, but turned out to be a good complimentary piece where he still may have that potential to be between he and KLS who caught what 52 balls last year, uh, a really good um, tandem there uh, at Penn state. Yeah. And you know, I mean, you mentioned that wide receiver in Ohio state, what he was there same time as what Olave Garrett Wilson, Jackson Smith and Jigba who've all been first round picks, Marvin Harrison, who's going to be a first round pick and Emeka Buke who's going to be a first round pick. So, you know, that's a tough, that's a tough thing to crack through. And, I think the fact that he was still able to see the playing time he did as wide receiver three just speaks volumes again to that work ethic of his, um, his commitment to his craft. And I think one other thing, I know I mentioned the, the locker room aspect of it. This past year, Penn State's offense obviously did not have the same explosive running ability that it did a lot in 2022. And they really missed the downfield blocking of Brenton Strange. And Fleming was – arguably the best downfield blocking wide receiver in college football last year. So I think adding him to the mix and adding that downfield blocking aspect that they really missed when Brent Strange went to the draft and wanted to be a second round pick of the Jaguars. I think getting that can really help 
bring back some of those explosive runs from Nicholas Singleton to Catron Allen again in the fall, because I think that that was a very underrated aspect of that that people overlooked was a lot of those runs, you know, it was like this year, they get through that first line, you get four or five yards. And then that's when strange would throw that knockout block that would spring you for the next 15, 20, 25 yards. And there was no one there to throw that block this year. So I think getting that aspect from Fleming could be huge for the offense as well. And Fleming's career, actually, the first year also overlapped Jamison Williams by one year. He was there. And at the back end, now Carnell Tate, who they're saying, if he fulfills his potential, another Mm -hmm. Marvin Harrison Jr., that's a long ways off. Who knows? And then, of course, Jeremiah Smith and everybody that they're getting this year. So just an overabundance there. Uh, In terms of the NFL draft decisions at Penn State, did those pretty much turn out the way you anticipated? Actually, again, I, th- I think that went better better for Penn State than anticipated. I think a lot of people expected Keandre Lambert-Smith to go, and he did not. Um, Devon Ellis and Hakeem Beeman, two of their top three defensive tackles, were fully anticipated to go pro and are coming back for a sixth year. And same with right guard Salim Wormley, who's a three-year starter in the offensive line. Everyone anticipated him to go pro, and he'll be back for a sixth year. So um, outside of those three of those five guys, I should say, four or five, however many it is, Things went according to plan, but whenever the things that don't go according to plan are guys returning, you expected to lose. That that's a big positive. I mean, obviously, Olu Fashanu was always going to go. Kalen King was always going to go. Johnny Dixon was always going to go. These guys that read out as potential first round picks, Chop Robinson as well. But so those were those were four guys that they did not expect back, and getting them back is huge. But especially the defensive tackles, because defensive tackle was going to be a position they were going to need to address in the transfer portal, or else risk having to throw some true freshmen to the fire in the fall. But now that you get Beeman and Ellie's back, you return your top four defensive tackles from last year. Same group that's been the top four defensive tackles dating back to 2022. So that all of a sudden is a very deep, very talented, very experienced room for Penn State and should be a real strength for Tom Allen's defense next year. Marty, we've talked about it a zillion times about the 12-team playoff arriving at this at the right time for Penn State. And you could see that for a lot of programs. However, we have truly meant that for Penn State. If you go year to year, as you well know, and I've talked about this many times with, with you here and not here, that it just has proven that this would be the program that would benefit the most. Uh, after another, I want to call it a typical Penn State season, in good ways and in not so good ways, I think that's pretty obvious to the average college football fan exactly what I mean there, too. I don't know what's going on inside of Penn State circles about how people feel about the program, but nationally, it seems like something needs to break free, break loose, break through, because there's this, well, they're really good, but it's not happening. Yeah, and you know, I've I've talked about this with a lot of people, friends of mine on Twitter, on on our message board at, at happy valley insider like i think a lot of people it's twofold one how much different is this program viewed as james franklin viewed if they're not in the same division i'm not even say ohio state and michigan it's even just ohio state because up until the last three years james franklin had a winning record against michigan since 2016 so you throw out the first two years where they're still dealing with sanctions and roster limits and all that 2016 through 2020 james franklin had a winning record against michigan you know so it was always the Buckeyes that held them back. And they, they've won more games. There, there's been no program that's won more games at Penn State during the playoff era and not made the playoff. Like we've gone at it a million times, like you said. And, and the other aspect of that for me is people are frustrated because they can't get over that hump. But at the same time, those frustrations, and I've been frustrated by it at times too, those frustrations stem from the fact James Franklin has taken this program up a level to a level it hasn't been in a long time. You know, you everybody in Penn State circles will talk about the 1999 Minnesota game where they blew it at the end. Minnesota hit the field goal. Penn State won from being ranked number one in the country, probably the best team in the country to lose in their last three games. From that game until James Franklin arrived in the, through the 2000s and the 2010s, you had a couple outlier years. But this team was averaging like eight, nine wins a year. You had multiple losing seasons in there. Had a couple years where they didn't win any games in the Big Ten. And now Franklin has gotten them back to where these last eight years since 2016 is the best eight year run they've had since at least the early to mid nineties, maybe probably really have to go back to the eighties when they won two titles in eight years to the last time they had this kind of success in an eight year stretch. 
So I think that's something too people need to remind themselves of is, yes, it's frustrating, but a lot of that frustration stems from the fact James Franklin has done a tremendous job, has taken this program to a level it hasn't been at in a very long time. And, you know, I would much rather as a program be frustrated with, man, we're winning 10 games a year and this isn't good enough. Like Jay one side of the running backs coach put it perfectly. He had a press conference at the end of the year when he was serving as co-offense coordinator and someone asked him about, you know, hey, you've been here for a long time as a position coach. Have you ever thought about going elsewhere to be a coordinator or anything? And I forget what the full quote was. But part of it was, I love working in a place where we get pissed off about going 10 and 2. And I thought that was very telling where it's like most programs would kill to have the success they have had the last decade. But to them, it, it's not good enough. And it's what drives them. And like you said, that 12-team playoff, I think, is going to benefit them more than any other program in the country. Because even you you look at you look ahead the next year, you don't play Michigan. Outside of Ohio State, your toughest game is probably a trip to Wisconsin. So going eleven and one is very doable. At worst, you should be ten and two again. And I have a hard time seeing a Big Ten team, especially one with the cloud of Penn State, winning double digit games and being left out of a twelve team playoff. I mean, I know we don't know one hundred percent yet what the makeup's going to look like because the five and seven idea is probably out the window with the collapse of the, of the Pac twelve. But I just I have a hard time seeing a scenario where. You know, any team out of the Big Ten or the SEC with the schedule they have to play can win double digit games and get left out most years. And like I said, they have a very favorable schedule next year. You get Ohio State at home also. So that makes them, I mean, is, is Ohio State's probably going to go to the year, maybe ranking them in the country with what they've done. But still, you'd much rather play them at home than in Columbus. So I, I think they are set to really improve, not necessarily improve as a program, but their, their, the national reputation, like you said, improve as a program. Because again, I think. This is a program, and James Franklin is a coach who is looked at much differently if they wouldn't have had to spend the last eight years in the same division as Ohio State. Because let's say even Penn State or Ohio State would have been in the Big Ten West, I think there would have been multiple years. They would have played each other in Indy. Both could have come in undefeated, and both probably already had a playoff spot locked up. So I I do think that they're really going to – that national perception of the program will benefit from the 12-team playoff. Because you alluded to it, I could have packed a better punch with that question if I would have also included Michigan just won a national championship and Ohio <laughs> State spending like drunken sailors and acquiring like free agents all over the place, uh, whether that adds to the the angst and the apprehension about breaking through. Uh, well, I think part of what the breaking through thing, Penn State doesn't play Michigan again until I think like 26 or 27. So you don't have to deal with them for a couple of years. And if you do, you're playing them at Indy. And again, you get to the Big Ten title game at 11-1 or better, you're probably already in the playoff anyhow. And I also think part of it with Michigan, I personally still think Harbaugh is going to go to the NFL. Rather, it's Atlanta. Rather, it's the Chargers. I think he's going to go. And Michigan's Michigan. They're, I think it's similar to Penn State in a lot of ways, but they're always going to be really good. But Harbaugh has leveled that program up. Rather, it's shown more, or if they go make an external hire, can you expect them to continue to stay at that level? You know, I I don't know if you can. I think a lot of that is a result of Harbaugh and what he's done. And even this past year, I think, was kind of a uh, a culmination, just the perfect storm of they brought a lot of guys back who were seniors who wanted to come back and make one more run at this thing. They were loaded on defense. Um, so I, I do think that, again, I don't think Michigan is going to fall off by any – stretch of the imagination but i do think that if harbaugh goes they will take a little bit of a step back and maybe more of what we saw from michigan in the later lloyd Carr years where hey you're consistently winning those nine or ten games but you're not you know number one in the country going undefeated winning the big ten three years in a row 